Well, hi everyone. So we're going to work on the boost converter project again today. Now, in the last video, we saw some considerations for making the power stage. So in today's video, we're going to look at some of the considerations for sizing the gate driver and the gate resistor, and we're also going to look at the setup that we're going to use for the pulse width modulator. So when you're sizing the gate driver and gate resistor, the goal is to make the power transistor switch as quickly as possible without destroying the gate driver from an overcurrent, and without destroying the power transistor from over, over voltage. So the first thing that you need to consider is what's the acceptable range of gate resistors to use for the power transistor. And for that, we're going to take a look at what the manufacturer recommends in their data sheet. So when you read a data sheet for an IGPT or a MOSFET, you'll always notice that they do a timing test usually the T on and TF test and they tell you how long it takes to switch on and switch off but you'll always see them specify RG right here and this one says 2.7 ohms so usually for the timing test they're testing it with the minimum recommended value gate resistor now usually it can be anywhere from that value up to 10 times that value that's usually the acceptable range for the resistance of the gate resistor. Okay, so you'll notice in this part of the data sheet, this line that reads conditions for protection against short circuits, and they again specify a 2.7 ohm gate resistor. Now you can use a value lower than that, but if you do, and the IGPT experiences a short circuit, the turnoff voltage spike will almost certainly destroy it. So that's why they give you this minimum value. Now the value of acceptable gate resistors, as I said, is usually this value and multiplied by 10. So for this IGBT, it's about 2.7 ohms up to 27 ohms. Now keep in mind using bigger ones will reduce the need for gate drive current and gate drive power, but it will also cause it to switch more slowly and it will cause greater losses, greater switching losses. So once you've determined what gate resistor that you want to use, you need to check and see if it's going to use too much power or too much current, if the requirements will be too big for your gate driver and gate drive power supply. Okay, so the gate driver that I intend on using is the HCPL3120 optically isolated gate driver. And as you can see, it says right here in the features that it should have a 2.5 amp maximum peak output current and a 2 amp minimum peak output current. So the only thing we really need to do here is a simple test is Ohm's law current is equal to voltage divided by resistance so if the voltage is 15 volts I'm not using negative gate drive so it's just 15 volts on 0 volts off and we divide it by 2.7 ohms we can see that's well above what our peak current rating would be so what we need to do then we need to take 15 volts divided by the peak current which is 2 amps and it's suggesting that our minimum value gate resistor, if we want to use this gate driver, is 7.5. So the other thing that we need to consider is, with using the peak current and that value gate resistor, are we going to dissipate more power than the gate driver can do continuously? So we found the total power dissipation here in the data sheet, and it says we have 295 milliwatts to work with. So now we need to determine how much power the IGBT gate drive will consume if it'll go above the maximum power dissipation for our gate driver. So Mitsubishi Electric that makes the IGBT modules has this great document using IGBTs and I have the address here highlighted so if you want to read it it's right here. Now in this document there's a good ca formula for calculating the IGPT's gate drive power consumption. QG is the gate charge and FC is the switching frequency and VGE, pretty self-explanatory, that's the gate drive voltage. The only problem that I really see with this is that I don't know what the gate charge is QG for my IGBT. A similarly sized one from Mitsubishi is about 1.5 micro columns. So we're going to try the calculation here. So I know my gate drive voltage should be 15 volts. And I know what the charge should be. 
Okay, now multiply that by 500. That's our switching frequency, 500 hertz. And as you can see, that's quite a low figure. But I'm not sure I believe it. So we're going to test it in the real world. Okay, so we're going to do a real world measurement of the power consumed by the IGBT gate driver. Now I couldn't find a 7.5 ohm resistor, so I had two 3.9 ohm resistors. I put them in series. So we're using, it's about 8 ohms for the gate resistor. And when you perform this test, you want to make sure that you are doing it uh, under load because the voltage and current of the IGBT does influence the power consumed by the gate. Now, my clamp on meter, the Hall effect meter, it won't read currents this low. So, what I've done, I've connected the gate drive power supply in series to this meter, which measures in milliamps. So, let me plug in the gate drive power supply. And you can immediately see why that formula, even though it was valid for the gate drive power consumed, it's not completely and entirely accurate because there is some standby power being consumed by the gate driver. But let me go ahead and increase the pulse width. and that's back off again. So that was about 5 milliamps. So it's a simple calculation then from there. We'll do 15 volts times 5 milliamps. And as you can see, the total power consumed is about 75 milliwatts. So that's well within our range. So I've had my eye on this DC to DC converter for the gate drive power supply. That way we'll be able to power it from the batteries or whatever 24 volt input we'll be able to use. I don't know if I'm going to use this one just yet, but it's looking like a good candidate. Our consumed current, as indicated by the meter, was around 5 milliamps. This is able to output 67 milliamps, and it looks like the voltage input is good, and it has 1,000 volts worth of isolation protection. So that looks like a good one. Again, I don't know if this is final, but it's a uh, Murata MER 1S2415 SC. So that might be a good candidate, but we'll get back to that. So now we can move on to the pulse width modulator. Now I was going to make a complicated pulse width modulator, but I think I'll make it simple just for anyone who's ever trying this, maybe for the first time. So we are going to use the Arduino because I do have it. And I'll show you how to set this up for basic pulse width modulation at 500 hertz or close to it. Now you notice the section on the board that's labeled PWM and you have a number of different outputs. So the red wire is connected to PWM output number three and the black wire is just connected to the ground. Now once you've got it set up there are very many different ways to control the pulse width. Like You could use feedback from the boost converter if you wanted to make one that was regulated but in this case I'm going to keep it simple like I said for everybody so I'm going to use a potentiometer to control the pulse width so what you need to do is connect the wiper arm that's the middle one to analog input A0 now the left lead is going to connect to the 5 volt output there from the power section and the black lead which is the right is connected right into the ground okay so programming it is pretty simple but it starts with the USB connection just a simple cable like this will do the job just plug the A end of the cable into a computer running Windows or Linux and plug the B end into the board. Alright, so after you've completed those steps, you'll just need to go to the Arduino website, go to this section here, have the address highlighted, and you'll need to get the development environment for your operating system of choice. Whatever you've got, they're all here. Now once you've got the software installed, just open it up 
and you'll need to type in this code or I'll make a link to it available in the description. This is not my code by the way. This is just something that I found online that does the pulse width modulation. And once you do that, once you have it typed out, go ahead and verify it. It's the check mark right here. And once you have the code verified and it's error free, you can go ahead and click this arrow here to upload it and it will upload it onto the board and you're done. Okay, so once you have the code up uploaded, you can go ahead and connect the output to an oscilloscope, or if you don't have an oscilloscope, you can use an LED just to see if it works. And we will check and see what the waveform looks like. Okay, so when you first start, there should be no waveform. And as you slowly turn the potentiometer, you should see pulses increase and as you keep turning the potentiometer you should see the width of the pulses increase. It doesn't go completely to 100% but that's okay because we don't want 100% pulse width for our boost converter. Now the Arduino board does require a 5 volt power supply and I've got one here plugged in but if you don't have that you can still plug it into the USB port plug it into a computer or any USB power supply and it'll still work that way. Now the output of the Arduino board is just going to go to the input of the HCPL 3120 gate driver. Now I will have complete wiring diagrams for all of it once the project is finished. Well guys that's going to do it for this one. So in the next video we're going to try to look at thermal management and power dissipation from the IGBT and cooling. So if you do have any questions, comment on YouTube, send me an email, leave me a message. I thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you next video.